Hey everybody! Welcome to Mom to Mom on Thursday morning. I am glad to be back with you because it's been a couple of weeks and I can't wait to catch up with you and see what's going on in your world while we're in the middle of a staying at home for the COVID crisis and post-tornado. Good morning, Olivia, and good morning, Cameron. <clears throat> Great to see both of you. And Rebecca, hey there. As uh, people are joining us this morning, I want you to post something. Hey, Marcy, I want you to post what uh, was your situation with the, with the tornado. So just do something brief, like we lost power for X number of days, or we had this damage, or we lost our home, or we have had to move, or whatever the situation is. So go ahead and post that so we can keep up, and we'll try to get the others to do that as well when they begin to join us. Uh, for Larry and me, we uh, lost power for four days uh, until Thursday night, and that was just a minor inconvenience compared to what so many uh, experienced. I see Olivia lost power, but no damage. That was our situation too. But I know Ashley Baird, who um, is on our Facebook group, uh, lost their home and it's been a really uh, challenging period for them. And uh, I've been interested in the post that she has given us. And she gave one post that she, where she shared things to take with you when you go to your safe place during the tornado, she says, make sure you take your shoes. And I thought that was so important just to remind people because when we got the notice a little after 11 p.m. on Easter night, many people were already in bed. And sometimes you get the alarm, the notice, and you just grab the kids and you get yourself into the safe place and you forget those important things. And so it's important for us to remember uh, those things to do when we get the notice, albeit how very short it might be. Uh, Cameron says they were in Hickson and they weren't impacted, so uh, the way that others were. <clears throat> yes, many of us are in the East Brainerd area and we uh, all uh, felt the effects of it in various ways. It, it was just a, a really rough time. You know, we had that wonderful Easter morning. Our service was so incredibly wonderful uh, streaming. It was just so meaningful. And the the music, thank you, Olivia, and all those others who did that, uh, was so worship-filled. I was just on this wonderful spiritual high. And I know that many of you were also. And then um, that night, uh, we experienced something we don't ever want to go through again. Uh, so we will be mindful of the things we need to do and, and to take with us. One other tip was to take, uh, put your kids' bicycle helmets on them. And I thought that was a wonderful tip. One of my friends uh, did everything she thought was right. And she, she took her purse even with all those important things like her driver's license and social security numbers and credit cards. And she had that with her and she thought she was in a safe place, but it was actually right next to a stairwell and it caved in and it collapsed on her purse and all of her special belongings. And so she had to start over with all of those. She lost her home. And so she was thankful that her life was spared. But in addition to dealing with the home, she had to go back and deal with social security numbers and credit cards and, uh, and all of that. So I think we've all learned a lot and had the importance of keeping flashlights with us and uh, getting, um, all the other things that we, we need to shelter in place in a new way. <laughs> We're learning a lot about sheltering in place. And I see Haley, you lost power, but no damage. Most of us hopefully had that experience uh, that we didn't have much damage. Well, we are in our series on correction and how to do that and what is most helpful when we are correcting children. We know that what we're looking for is a change in their heart. 
uh, because when there's a change in the heart, the change in the behavior will follow. Good morning, Lizzie. Glad to see you. Hey, Stacy. Glad you all are, are joining us. Uh, so we that's our goal is to see the the change in the heart of the child because that's where that's where our motivation our internal motivation is it's on it's internal it's inside and so we want to see that change and so our goal in all of these exercises that we're doing and all these strategies is to see the heart change and so we begin this by looking at using our words because that's what we want ultimately is to be able to say to the child this is what I expect you to do this is what I'm telling you to do now, and then that they do it the first time, because when they do that, they're honoring and obeying you, and that's what our goal is. And sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't, and when it doesn't, we have to go to the next level of correction. And for many children, taking a break is the appropriate next step. They have to take a break. It's really important if a child has become unhinged, <laughs> they are having a temper tantrum, or they are stomping their feet, any, any indication that they've lost control to any level. Oh, there's my sweet daughter-in-law, Kristen. Good morning. Uh, any degree that the child has lost control, and who has lost um, the, the, any sense of reason, then the child needs to take a break. And that's where you put the child into uh, a, a seat or a special place in the room. For some children, they can go to their own room. And the older a, ch a child is, for example, teenagers, uh, they can go to their room. And so they, they take a break. And the purpose of the break is to time out, uh, to take a time out uh, so that they can come back and have a reasonable conversation. That's the purpose of taking a break. It's not the punishment. It is take a break until we can talk about what's going on and we can come to a solution. The purpose is to do that. So having them to go to their room for 10 minutes or five minutes or 30 minutes or an hour or two days is not really what we're looking for here. We're looking for them to take a break until they can have a reasonable conversation with the problem. And then the next step is to give a consequence. And so this is a form of discipline. And so a consequence can look lots of different ways. We've talked about uh, various kinds of consequences. The first one is a natural consequence. If you tell a child not to run and the child runs and falls, the natural consequence is there he has a skinned knee or he has something that uh, has happened as a result of what you told him not to do. And then our response is not, I told you not to do that. I told you what was going to happen, but our response is empathy and compassion with the note also. That's why we don't run, or what did you learn from this? Uh, why did you fall? Oh, because I was running. And so you make that connection. So they see there are natural consequences. I gave the example of Jesus doing this with Peter when, when Peter was walking on the water toward Jesus. And he, as long as he was looking at Jesus, he was walking on the water but when he took his eyes off Jesus then he fell into the water that was a natural consequence that's a great little reminder for all of us when we take our eyes off Jesus and we don't follow him and do the things he asks us to do there are going to be natural consequences same thing when we're dealing with children the next kind of consequences was a logical consequence. And we looked at that as the punishment fits the crime. And so if a child is roughhousing with the dog and uh, the logical, and the dog then snaps or, or, or bites or, or gets rough and rowdy with the child, that there is a, a logical consequence and the child cannot play with the dog for a while. That's the logical consequence. If the child leaves uh, some work uh, or some uh, a coat or something, uh, a belonging at school, and then the logical consequence, if you've been working on that and that's been a habit, then they uh, have to wear a another coat. They can't wear that coat for an extended period of, of time. Those are logical consequences. Uh, we also talked about what happens if you have a door slammer 
And if you have a door slammer in your home, a logical consequence can be removing the door from the frame so they don't have the privilege of privacy because they've slammed the door. So that's what we've been talking about over the last few weeks. So today we're going to pick up with what is perhaps the most common consequence, and that is the loss of a privilege. Now, what I hope you're hearing here is that this is, it in many ways, is sequential when we're looking at consequences. We start with words, then we go down the next step until we get to what we inevitably might have to do, and that is a loss of privilege. Sometimes parents skip to this immediately. And so they, they forego the other steps and they forego the training that might need to take place. They forego the uh, idea of having a conversation about behavior and go straight to uh, loss of privilege. So it, it might sound like this. I told you not to do that. You were never supposed to do that. Okay, give me the keys to the car. Or they say, okay, now you have no television for a week or give me your phone, no phone for uh, the next two weeks, or just go straight to that. And it has, it has little meaning uh, in the long run because what the child is doing is just, is just doing time. There is no incentive to earn the privilege back. And that's what we want to be thinking of when we're looking at loss of privilege. So as I'm teaching this today and giving you ideas, I want you to post any questions that you have about any behavior and consequence and what you might be struggling with with loss of a privilege. So be thinking of those questions as I'm sharing with you what loss of a privilege is supposed to look, look like. So the hope here and the goal is that the loss of a privilege is going to bring about change because that's what correction is supposed to do. It's supposed to bring about change and it's supposed to bring about heart change. Now this is the last one in our series on consequences and correction. Now here's the reality. Some children aren't mature enough and aren't dis disciplined enough to handle privileges. Let me say that again, because that's something we need to, to focus on. Some children are not mature enough to handle privileges. And so you need to know your child well enough to know when they are uh, old enough and mature enough to handle a privilege that you've given them. So uh, you, you know that by their behavior. If they become responsible with that privilege, then their behavior is going to sh show it. <clears throat> if they're not mature enough, then they're gonna exhibit bad behavior because they just aren't disciplined enough to do it. And so, for example, if you give free reign of the use of technology and you say, uh, you know, here is the iPad or here is the, the phone or here is the whatever, whatever gadget and gizmo that you have that's related to technology and here it is and let's look for the apps and let's get you set up and then you give it to them and you say the words, but now we, we are only going to use this 30 minutes a day or we're only going to use this, you, you get to use this after dinner for an hour or whatever uh, you decide to do and you just say the words and then you watch. And if they're able to self-discipline, then they're mature enough to handle that privilege. But if they're not mature enough to handle that privilege, then you have to, you have to intervene and you, you have to supervise a little more closely. You have to put in some kind of regulations to make sure that it happens. So along with privilege, comes oversight. It becomes, there comes a sense of responsibility on your part as well as the child's part. So be thinking now of privileges you've given your children and then begin to think right now if they are mature enough and responsible enough to handle the privileges. Because it's miserable to be given something, this wonderful thing to do or this great game or whatever it is and then not be mature enough to handle it the way that you expect them to. So we don't want to set them up to fail. Um, for example, I know a family who gave the privilege of walking to school 
uh, for, for the child, but the child did not have the maturity to handle all that was involved in walking to school with children who were older and who were um, maybe badgering a little bit and being a little bit of a bully. And so the, the child began to exhibit behavioral problems. And so that meant this child couldn't handle that privilege. There wasn't anything wrong with um, the, the child was, you know, for example, it wasn't a bad child. She wasn't a, a terrible uh, little girl. It's just that she couldn't handle that. And so the child had been sort of set up to fail because she wasn't mature enough. She didn't have the discipline enough uh, to handle that kind of privilege. So this is one of the most important things I'm telling you about giving children privileges, making sure they can handle the privileges. Now, so when they cannot handle the privilege, then we, we have to look at more oversight and then once we have put in all the, the regulations, the guidelines, you may do this for, and then we say how long or how it's supposed to look or whatever it is, playing outside, playing with a friend, driving a car, name, concept, name privileges. Just go ahead and start listing those so I can see what kinds of privileges you give your children and that, that will help me to know how to direct some of the conversation and some of the suggestions for consequences. So do uh, you let your children play with certain toys for a certain amount of time and that's a privilege? Do you let them play outside with a friend but you don't have to be outside with them? That is a privilege. Do you let your children go to the neighbor's house to play? Uh, that's a privilege. Okay, so I'm seeing Haley's posted screen time. So you give, that's a privilege to give a child screen time. And so we want to put in the parameters of screen time. And then we want to couple that with oversight and looking at, at uh, how it works and making sure that, that they are supervised with this. And so when they do not uh, live into the parameters that you've set, when they do not uh, follow the guidelines, that's when we go to consequences. And so now Rebecca's posted playing at the neighbor's yard without me right there. Yeah, that's, see, that's a privilege. And so we want to know if the child is able to do that and to do it responsibly, and that's a privilege. Talk to them in terms of, of, of privilege and, and talk to them about that. TV time is another thing. Here's another example that uh, Cameron is giving, riding through the neighborhood on the bicycle without an adult. That's a privilege. Talk to your child about that word privileges. This is a privilege that I'm giving you. And so I want you to do well with this. And so the, here's how the privilege looks. When you ride your bike, this is what I expect. You teach them how to do how to do that. Which side of the street do you ride on? You ride on the same side of the street as the traffic is going. You can go from here to this friend's house. That, that is the parameter. And, and here's what will happen if you don't follow the guidelines. And if you don't return when I say, then we will go to consequence and then put this in there. These are words, and I'm telling you the words, and if you obey the words and you honor and obey me with that, we don't have to go to the next step. Do you see, if you've been watching this series and you know how I've just put that together, you say these are the words. This is the privilege. These are the guidelines, the parameters, the rules, whatever you want to call them, and this is what will happen in life if you follow that. You get to do that. You get to have this wonderful privilege and it, and it won't end until you don't follow the rules and the guidelines. And then when you don't, then you will have to suffer some consequences. So now that's the package. Can you put a package together with the things that you've just listed about TV time and about using screen time, about playing in the neighbor's yards? Can you start formulating now how you are gonna make that conversation happen? Whether we're talking about uh, someone who's three or four years old, or we're talking about elementary or high school, or if you have a college age kid living in your home, <laughs> the, these, this works. This, this is how life is going to look with the privilege. And this is how life is going to look if you abuse the privilege. Okay, so can you tell me right now by giving me an emoji or a comment that you're tracking with me on this so far, that we're getting the concept. So just give me some kind of indication that you're following me here. 
that we do words, that we do uh, lay out the privilege, we lay out the privilege, and then we set the parameters, and then we tell them we want to use words here only. And if that doesn't work, then we're going to go into consequences. And good morning, Kayla. I'm so glad to see you. Welcome. Glad you are joining us. Uh, okay, so I'm seeing you respond with thumbs up, and you're giving me some emoji. So now we have we have that picture of how this is supposed to look. Now, so now let's look at this concept that they you've given the privilege, and they have abused it in some way. All right, so write down um, on your comments some way they may have abused this privilege of screen time, TV watching playing with toys, driving a car, riding a bicycle, whatever it is in your world, because I know from who's watching that we have from infants all the way through college. I know that's the audience today. So we have a wide array of privileges that are out there. So please just give a comment on what a privilege is and what an abuse of the privilege might be because we're going to try to give some specific examples today of how to deal with the consequences so as you're posting i'm going to be uh, making comments about what we look for in consequences the key to consequences and those who've been in my classes before know the word i'm getting ready to say you know <laughs> what i'm getting ready to tell you the key to consequences is finding the child's, and I know you're going to be, be writing this down, you're going to be commenting on this, currency. Finding the child's currency. The currency is whatever object, privilege, activity, hobby, uh, toy, whatever is the most important thing to the child in this phase of life. And so I see Lizzie's uh, telling us the privilege is a cell phone. Okay, and a consequences could be no phone, or, or that's the rule, no phone after 9 p.m. So there's the, there's the rule. And so that's a great guideline. They have a cell phone, but nobody can be on the phone after 9 p.m. Hey, you know what? That's my own self-imposed rule, too. Um, I, um, at 9 o'clock, I go to Do Not Disturb because after nine o'clock, I think I've told y'all before, I, I don't think well. I, it's been this way all my adult life. At nine o'clock, I just start shutting down. Um, and so that's a great guideline. So we have a rule. Now here's Rebecca, whining or talking back when TV uh, is asked to be turned off at the time limit, limit when dinner is ready and, it, and it's time to... Uh, time or when it's time to go. Okay, so there's that's great. The, the, the rule is uh, we, the TV is on and they can have the privilege of the TV. But then when you ask them to turn off, then here's what happens. There's whining, there's talking back. And so we need to figure out what is the consequences. Well, I think that one is goes back to logical consequences. The punishment fits the crime. And so then there's going to be some loss of that privilege of watching TV. And so we're gonna look at how the loss looks and how they can earn it back. And here, let me tell you what I know. Th that Now that you're sheltering at home and you have these children 24 seven, and there is no teacher who is uh, helping to give you a break, <laughs> um, that, that screen time, television, cell phones are important in your life for your sanity because it keeps them occupied for some of the time. So I know I know that is what's happening. And then if I tell you that you have to take away that screen time, or that TV time as a consequence because that's a currency, I mean, your world is all already shattered and I'll see if I lose anybody on that. <laughs> Hope not. Uh, so uh, what, what you have to figure out is how you can make that work so that it works quickly and they get their attitude right so they can get the privilege back. All right, so now then, let's give some examples. So let's say we have a 16-year-old. Her name is going to be Carrie, and she talks on the phone for long periods of time. She disregards your, your warnings, and she disregards the, the rules, and so mom takes the, the phone away. 
So that's the consequence. The phone is taken away. And anytime Carrie needs to make an important call, and maybe she does have to make a call, she has to ask mom for the phone and mom supervises the use of the phone. That's temporarily until she can get it back. The key is Carrie's going to have to earn the phone back by honoring and obeying. And when her attitude is right, Mom gives Carrie the phone back and not until the attitude is right. And you know your child better than anyone else. And you know when your child is sincere and the heart has changed and they really mean something. And that's when you know it's for real. Uh, otherwise, uh, you, you can't just buy into their, their tears and their flailing around and, and, and I promise never, never. You give it time, time enough to know that the heart has been changed. Or let's say we have uh, another, uh, we have a seven-year-old. Um, her name's Wendy and Wendy is disrespectful to mom. But Wendy's currency is going to her friend's house to play. And so the consequence for her disrespect is that she cannot go to her friend's house to play. There's the currency is connected with the consequence. Um, okay, and then we have uh, little Timmy, and Timmy is 10 years old, and he procrastinates doing his homework. Okay, anybody have one of those? Procrastination doing the homework. And so here's what Dad says. He can't watch the baseball game. Uh, well, that's kind of funny now because there aren't any on there. So oh, he can't watch whatever he wants to do on the TV, watch whatever he wants to do on the TV until the work's done. I mean, that's the parameter that should be in place that uh, you, you uh, do your homework and then you get to have the privileges. And if you don't do your homework, you don't get your privileges. And if television is the currency and the greatest privilege, that's what has to go. And so you have a preschooler and the preschooler is uh, losing his temper, throwing a temper tantrum, acting up in any way, then what is the currency for the, the preschooler? Well, sometimes it's favorite toys, and so you remove the toys, and so you take the box of whatever toys, and they get put away. They get put up in the closet. This is kind of a visual thing for them. This is getting removed, and you will not get this back until you can show me that you have good behavior and that you're not going to throw a temper tantrum when I ask you to do ABC, what, whatever it is. And so uh, removal of something. And so remember, the key is you don't tell them how long it's going to be removed because you don't know. It, it's not gonna work to say the rest of the day or until daddy comes home. <laughs> No, we're not doing that. Um, and you don't, can't say for a week and you can't say for two weeks because your child may not have a heart change for a month. It, it may not have a heart change for a week, um, hours, whatever it is. It may not happen. And so you don't know when to give the privilege back. All right, so the key to building internal motivation with this type of consequences is for the child to earn the privilege earn the privilege. And so we make a mistake when we, uh, we set the time frame for uh, the loss of the privilege. That is a common, uh, um, it's a behavior modification strategy is uh, to do a time on it, but we're, we're doing, we want behavior to be modified, but more importantly, we want the heart to be modified modified. Do y'all get that? Are y'all understanding me on that? So give me some indication that that is our goal here. So give me some emoji or some comment that you understand what we're talking about here is we all, we want the behavior to change, but the behavior will stay changed longer if the heart is changed. There's the connection. So please y'all indicate, I'm seeing you all respond to that. That's really important to know. All right. So by taking away the privilege, uh, for a, uh, a set time period, you m remove the most important ingredient in discipline, and that is there's no motivation to change. See, there's a key line I'm telling you right there. When you impose the time frame, you remove the motivation to change. See, there is nothing the child would need to do to get the TV back or the car back or the video game or the toy back. There's no motivation 
And so Haley says, sometimes I find it hard in my four-year-old to decide whether it's really a heart change or not. That's hard in four-year-olds because, oh, they can bat those big, beautiful blue eyes at you and, and you think, oh, this is real. So it's hard. That's uh, that, because their personality is still new and de fresh and developing. And so it's hard to, to actually know. So the test is in the pudding. And so then, then you give it back when you think. I mean, you, you you give it as long as you can and you think there's a heart change, but I'm going to give you some strategies in just a minute so that you know you put in some little thing in between as a practice period to see. And they know that you, this is not permanent that I'm giving you this privilege back, but here is the period uh, in between we're going to see and we're also going to practice it. So let's see how that works. So that's a good one to lead us right into uh, the next time. And so here is how you can help build internal motivation. You, so you don't just leave them hanging with, uh, okay, I'm removing this because your behavior has been wrong. You don't just say that, and you don't just say, and when your heart has changed, I'll give it back. And so you have to give them a roadmap how it's going to look. Don't we need to know? I mean, what if your, your boss took away some kind of uh, responsibility that you had and that you love to do and, and, and he said, I'm taking this away because you just didn't do that right. But, and one day when I figure out if you're ready, I'll give it back. But what's the roadmap? What is it that he needs to see? And maybe you were procrastinating. Maybe you were late in, in doing things. You have to know what it's going to take. It's the same thing in school. P teachers paint the picture of what, a, what an A looks like. So you know what you have to do to get an A. It's the same thing here. So you paint the picture. So here is what you say. I'll give you the video game back when you show me that you have a positive attitude when I give you the instruction. Okay, I'm going to say that again because that's one of those things that uh, you can write down in your script. Oh, by the way, I've given you all notes on this. And I sent it in an email and I think I posted it on Facebook. So if... If uh, you can switch over and get that, you, you might you, you make sure you're looking at, at the notes. Hey, I see some more mamas have joined us. Glad y'all are here, Katie and Stacy. And so building internal motivation. Here are the words you say when you have removed a, uh, a, uh, a privilege. I'll give you the video game back or whatever, the toy the privilege of riding your bike, going to the neighbors, using this object, the cell phone or whatever. I'll give it back to you when you show me that you have a positive attitude when I give you an instruction. And then here's another clue here. You can, we can practice when you're ready. You see, hear that? We can practice when you're ready. So think about the things that you can practice. So let's say they come back and it sounds as if that the child, whether it's the four-year-old or the 10-year-old or the 18-year-old or whatever. So here's how, how we're going to know that you're, it goes, we're going to give it back and we're going to practice because I'm going to tell you something and I want to see how you respond. So that's allowing them to earn the privilege back. And that gives them this sense of hope, this sense of hope. So if you just, see, here's the, here are the uh, extremes. So here is one extreme. You say, I'm taking this away, this, this video game, this privilege of the car or the toys or the TV or, or whatever. I'm taking, taking it away for two weeks. And remember, that's not what we do not do. And at the same time, we also don't say, I'm taking this away and I'll give it back to you when I think you're ready. So we want to go somewhere in the middle that says, I'm taking this away because you, and then whatever the infraction was, you state what it was, and then you say, I'll give it back when there's been a change in your attitude, and here's how I know it will look. When I ask you to do something, here's how it's going to sound. And then you show them how it's going to sound. You say the words, you go through the actions, you do an example, you do a practice. You see, parenting involves coaching and teaching and instruction. Sometimes we just go to those, those easy words to say and then we just move on. But you have to tell them the roadmap of how things are supposed to look. And so you say, I'm taking this away. Now you fill in the blank for whatever that is because I want you to start practicing whatever it is that you're removing from them. And, and what you've been posting has been the toy, 
the playing in the yard, the watching television, the telephone, screen time, all of those things. That's what you're taking away. And I'm taking this away and I don't know when you're gonna get it back. This is another good thing, this is up to you. This is up to you. And when I see that you can, and then you fill in the blank when you can answer, when you can respond the first time. When I ask you to turn the television off the first time, when you turn it off, I know that you can have that privilege back. Now, now, and then you think the time has gone and they've come to you and they've said, I've learned my lesson. I figured it out. I am sorry that I didn't do whatever. Then they said the words and then you're not sure that it's real. Then you say, okay, we're going to try this. We're going to try this for a little while and we're going to practice and we're going to see how this works. But this is not a per permanent giving you back the privilege. We're just going to practice. So how's that sounding to you? I see Rebecca has responded. I love that. I think my boys will respond well. And it would be a good test to make sure they understand attitude. See, we have to teach attitude. We have to teach what it is. And that's what we're looking for. All this is about attitude. It's about them having a good positive attitude and being responsive because that feeds into the uh, concept of the two uh, job responsibilities for children, and that is to obey you and to honor you. And so this all, all this, what we're talking about with consequences goes back to that. They're not obeying you and they're not honoring you. Obeying means they obey you when, and if you've watched me for any time or you've been in my classes for any time, the answer is the first time. Obey the first time. And that means they're honoring you. They honor you when they obey with the right attitude. And so when you have to remove a privilege, it's because they didn't do those two things. They did not obey you and they did not honor you. And, and I would also ask that you check to make sure that you have the appropriate expectations for behavior with whatever it is that you are having to set a consequences for, that, that you have been appropriate. Uh, for example, if um, you have let children have a privilege of playing with a friend or a sibling or watching television or using the phone or being at the neighbor's house and you've, you've let them do that and then all of a sudden in the middle of their whatever moment of um, enjoying whatever, then all of a sudden you yell out, hey, it's time to stop and come to dinner. Or I said to get in here now. Or we're, we're getting ready to leave. And so it's this abrupt instruction, this abrupt order. You've gone into command control abruptly and, and you have disrupted their privilege in an inappropriate way. You're going to get feedback. You're going to get pushback and you're going to get an attitude. So make sure you're doing your part there that you have given them a warning. You know, many times I say, here's the two-minute warning. I do that all the time. I do that in teaching classes. I say, this is the two-minute warning uh, because I, I do that every morning in my Wednesday WOW class because people are engaged in wonderful conversation and I'm just not going to get up and all of a sudden stop and expect them just to all fall into line because I am in front of the classroom. It's a two minute warning. I did this in my classroom with high school students all the time. Here is your two minute warning. Then whatever number is good for you and your family and your home, give them an indication that the time is coming to an end and what your expectation is. Again, you're training them. You're training them so that they will respond appropriately. But use the timers so things will, will go off. Use uh, set up a, a system so that whatever, set up their phone, put a do not disturb on their phone at nine o'clock so they can't get anybody. Uh, and you know how you can go in and put do not disturb except your favorites could be in the disturb and you could be the only favorite. <laughs> Mom and dad can be the only favorites and everybody else is blocked block them for a period. You can go in there and manufacture those times. Is this news for anybody? Do y'all like that? Those who have teenagers, put them do not disturb. So they cannot get caught. Now you'll have to monitor whether they're getting call, uh, they're making calls. Okay, so there are, are some uh, things about that. Giving them the words uh, that they know uh, um, this, this privilege is coming to an end and if you honor me with it, then this privilege can continue. 
All right, so give me some feedback on all of that and what we've just talked about and tell me your questions about it um, or that you're tracking with me and I have this, I'm going to practice it, or I have a question and I've tried this and that and that hasn't seemed to work. And as you're posting that, I'm going to go over um, the idea of more parental control. So, um, you, here's where you, you look to see what the infraction was to see, oh no, they're not ready for this privilege. Or, oh no, I'm going to have to have mo more oversight. I'm going to have to be involved in this more. And so let's say you've taken the, the little boy, uh, you've taken Pete and he is five and you've taken to him to the museum. And so little Pete is always touching the wrong thing and he is running uh, to and fro and he and you and Pete uh, is five years old and the Pete and the museum are just not getting along. So what is the logical thing for the parent to do to have more control? It's right here. We have to hold Pete's hand because I need more control of Pete. Pete is not ready to, to be turned loose into a museum. So more parental control. I hope that is an obvious one to see. Let's say you have a child who is supposed to practice piano. Um, practice whatever. Practice a sport. Practice gymnastics. Pra practice whatever it is. But uh, the, the child, and let's call uh, this child uh, Allie. So Allie uh, can't go five minutes without being distracted. And so distraction is a huge thing. And so what, what might need to happen? You might need to sit in with Allie as she's practicing. And so there might need to be a little bit more parental control. You have to figure out uh, this is a responsibility that the child has, but it's not working. And so I need to have more control. Now, that's hard and parents don't like to hear that because that takes so much more time and energy. But parenting is a full-time job. And what you have, uh, anything else, things that you get paid to do or other responsibilities that you have, they're connected on top of that. But, but parenting is the full-time job. And so that means a lot of instruction, that means a lot of hands-on, that means a lot of supervision, that means you provide a lot of order and a lot of structure and, and a lot of guidelines. Uh, and you can do that without being overbearing. Children need to know their parameters. And so here's a caution. Parents make the mistake of using natural consequences sometimes when a child is failing. So I don't want you to, to do that. Some say, oh, fine, just let him fail. He'll just learn his lesson that way. And so that's another example of where parental control needs to come in. We might need more parental control. Um, now, here's practicing the right thing. And this is the last thing we're going to talk about today. The consequences for a negative pattern of behavior may be to practice what the right thing is. Okay, this is another really important thing. So. Write that down. If I didn't put that in your, your notes, write it down. The consequence for a negative behavior pattern may be to practice doing the right thing. And so let's say that uh, you have a, a brother who is mean to the sibling and little Richie likes to be mean to the sibling. <laughs> They find that to be fun, and you can't find a consequence that's working. So mom then decides that uh, that Richie needs a different route there because we can't, it, it, that's one of those examples, you can't punish that enough. That's just, it, there's got to be a heart change. And so here is what might work for Richie, that you, you do a switch on consequences and you do a practice doing the right thing. And so here's where Richie has to practice doing two nice things to the sibling. Practices doing the nice things. Don't you love that? Oh, let me hear some something about that because I think that is a great strategy that uh, he's mean to her. Let's say Richie is mean to the little sister. And so now you're, you've got to switch the behavior, and so you have to show him how to do the right thing. And so you can prescribe the nice things or let Richie come up with what the nice things are, and Richie has to practice doing the nice things for the sibling. And so you repeat that. 
you repeat that a couple of times a day. Okay, Richie, it's it's time to do something really nice for, for our little sister, and so I want to see what it is. And so here is, uh, Olivia says, that's one thing I learned in my early education degree. We learn more from doing something correctly, yeah, than we uh, learn from uh, our mistakes. Yeah, that's right. So you practice doing the right thing. All right, so let's say we have a child who runs away from you in the grocery store. Anybody have that child? Runs away from going to, uh, when you're at the grocery store or runs away from you whenever. All right, here's how. See, that's again, it's hard to find the consequences that's appropriate. It's better in that case to practice doing the right thing. And so you practice during the day. You say, I'm going to call your name. I'm going to call your name, little Kim. And every time I call your name, I want you to come. And that's what we're going to be practicing today. And so every whatever, every hour, every two hours, every half hour, however the child is, so that the child can remember this, we're going to practice. Come, come right now. Come, come now. And so you practice it. And then you coach the child when you're getting ready to go to, into Walmart or Target because they're the only things open now and so you say we're going to practice this and so remember when I call your name you're going to come see that's practicing doing the right thing we've taken away consequences there it's practicing doing the right thing <laughs> Olivia said I wish the buggies had a five-point harness <laughs> I know um, but since they don't, we're going to practice doing the right thing before you go into the store. All right, so now you have an older child. Let's say, uh, let's say Bert is 14, and he has a bad attitude when you give an instruction. I love this one. All right, this is great for children who are a little bit older, perhaps, or, or teenagers. So Dad is going to tell Bert that he has five jobs for Bert to do this Saturday. He has five jobs. Bert is going to have to do at least two of them. So Bert is going to have to do two things. He's going to sweep out the garage. He's going to rake the yard, whatever. Maybe dad has him mow the grass or move bricks from here to there or whatever. He has five things to do. Bert's going to need to do two. And based on his attitude, he may have to do three or four or five. Hey, y'all, give me, give me feedback on that. Is that not wonderful? I love that. So here we go. This attitude thing's not working out with you. And so we've tried everything. We've taken away consequences. We've take, given you consequences, taken away privileges. That's not working. So we're going to practice what it looks like to have a good attitude. And so here's what we're going to do. And so I have things. You can do this with any any child. And so, um, so you can do this with a four-year-old, a seven-year-old, a ten-year-old, whatever. We're not liking this attitude thing going on here. And you show them what it is, stomping the feet or making a face or crossing their arms or uh, giving you back talk or whatever. This is not working out in our home. And we've tried all kinds of taking away everything, so we're going to try something else. And here's what it is. I have these things that need to be done around the house. I have a whole list. Now, depending on your attitude, then this could go, but your choice, your choosing, you're going to do two or you're going to do ten. It just depends on your attitude. And so don't you love that? So use their, their behavior and their response to your instructions to determine how many things on the list that they do. They're going to practice the right thing. Hey, Ashley Baird, I'm so glad you've joined us. I just talked about you earlier. We're so sorry for your loss. And I uh, thank you for your sweet uh, post that you've been giving to encourage us on how to face a, a terrible tragedy like that, and I'm just glad to, to see you. Uh, I'm gonna be in touch with you uh, later today. Or right, Rebecca, you like that idea, don't you? Practicing, so that's what I want you guys to do. Practice, practice, practice doing the right thing. And so that, I hope we've covered a lot of areas here on correction and consequences and practicing doing the right thing. Uh, because here's what we're wanting. We're wanting to see a change. We're wanting to see a change in behavior. Now I'm going to give you two things, two reasons that people change. This is universal. This goes beyond age. So it goes beyond children. People change for two things. One reason that motivates people to change is that life has become really uncomfortable. Life has become uncomfortable and people say, I don't want to live this way anymore. 
I'm uncomfortable with the way life is. I'm uncomfortable with who I am. I'm uncomfortable with the restrictions that have been imposed on me, with the new rules that have been put in place. So I've got to change because this makes me uncomfortable. That's one reason people change. The other is they get a vision for something better. They get a vision for something better. This works for children too. They're going to change if life has become really uncomfortable because uh, they see the consequences are playing out. And number two, if you paint a vision for how life can be much better, they will change. So you see how that works with children and discipline and consequences that you say, Here, here's how you're living now and that's not working out well. But if you do this, your life is going to look a whole lot better and that is motivation to change. So that kind of sums up uh, what we've, we've been talking about with our whole series on correction and consequences. I hope this has been helpful for you. I need to get some feedback from you, so let me know um, <clears throat> how that's been <clears throat> going for you. Um, also, send me your questions on this. Um, I'm, I'm trying to decide what to, to do next week, so let me know by uh, whatever is going on in your life uh, with what you need help on, and I can try to steer the class around that next week. So uh, please let me know how, how um, life is going and what you need most in uh, the area of children raising those, those youngins. Well, I miss you guys. Uh, I'm so thankful we can do this. We've, we've gotten new moms on board by this method, and I'm so glad it's working out. And I will plan to see you guys again next Thursday at 10 o'clock. Let me know what you need. Okay, love you guys. Have a great day.